Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Chairman of the U.S. Committee on the Budget, Representative John Yarmuth, and Economics Correspondent for the Washington Post, Heather Long. Good morning. We're excited to be here with John Yarmuth, who represents Kentucky, uh, the Louisville area. He is, of course, uh, chair of the House Budget Committee. He can tell the difference between Bourbon and Jack Daniels very well, I've learned. <laughs> and since we're here at the museum, <laughs> let me just say that he's also been a big champion of the media, that you uh, personally started uh, the Louisville Eccentric Observer in the right. early 1990s. Did. And he recently made a big donation to save the University of Louisville newspaper, the student newspaper. So that's, uh, thank you very much on behalf sure. of folks in the media. But perhaps his biggest claim to fame is that Stephen Colbert, the late night host, once compared him to Bruce Wayne, to Batman. <laughs> so we'll see if you can live up to that on the budget oh, issues. I'll do my best. <laughs> so, um, so right now, the country, we need a new budget. It's going to expire in September. If we don't do anything, there's going to be some pretty uh, substantial budget cuts, automatic budget cuts that would go into place, as you well know. Uh, do you support raising those, those spending caps? I think we have to. First of all, we, we still have an awful lot of um, investment opportunities and, and, and necessities that we've neglected over uh, the last decade or so. And if we don't raise the budget caps, we'll see a $125 billion cut in spending, uh, about half of that from defense and half of that from non-defense spending. So you know, the, the, we can argue about what appropriate levels of uh, defense spending are. I would have loved to have seen less defense spending than we actually put in, in our numbers. But uh, there's no question that on the, the non-defense side, which also, by the way, contains a lot of spending that's, in, that's national security related, because Homeland Security is part of that, FBI is part of that, the FDA is part of that, the FAA is part of that. But, and we have, we have needs in all of those areas. So to, to cut those by essentially 10%, which the Budget Control Act of 2011 would, would require, uh, I think would be devastating for a lot of very important priorities. Now, we're obviously here at the Fiscal Summit, so I have to ask, you authored the Investing for the People Act of 2019, which proposes uh, increases in both uh, military and um, non-defense spending, as you were just outlining. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how will we pay for that extra spending? Well, there are a lot of ways to pay for it. Uh, we, we didn't get to that part of the, uh, of the equation, but uh, certainly we cut taxes in 2017 by a significant amount. And uh, the, uh, the implications of those tax cuts uh, have turned out to be far different than they were uh, promised by uh, the Republicans who promoted them. <coughs> My friend Kev uh, Kevin Brady is going to be up here next, and uh, he can try to defend that. But uh, <laughs> there are an awful lot of, way, lot, lot of room in, just in those tax cuts to uh, to help pay for the increased spending. We actually raised spending, uh, we raised it over current levels, 17 billion on the defense side and 34 billion on the non-defense side. So uh, $51 billion total. And there's plenty of room in those tax cuts to, to recapture some of that revenue to pay for those, those increases. I'm glad you brought up the tax cuts because some independent analyses of your proposal uh, to, to increase the spending have pointed out that if we do what you're proposing, uh, if you spread that out over 10 years, we keep those new baseline spending levels that you're advocating for. Um, that costs about as much as the, as the GOP tax bill does. Interesting coincidence. <laughs> so, uh, so, <laughs> so you're at, you you really think that the key to to paying for what you're asking for and, and more spending is is to just repeal the tax cuts? Is that what I'm hearing from you? Well, I I would. Again, I think there's plenty of room on the defense side to, uh, to reduce spending. Uh, I don't know whether this Congress is up to making uh, structural changes in mandatory spending programs. If we, uh, uh, clearly there would be room, plenty of, there's plenty of money being spent on Medicare, Medi Medicaid, and Social Security, but I don't think anyone on either side of the aisle is ready to tackle that right now. 
There are some other tax expenditures that still exist after the tax cut that we could probably go after. We could raise the uh, uh, carried interest rate. There, we could do a wealth tax, as Elizabeth Warren is proposing. Uh, there are a lot of ways to generate income without, I think, uh, really hurting the economy at all. Uh, tell us, how are the negotiations going with the Senate and the White House to get a deal here? Not very well. And I, I will tell you that, you know, I've now lived, this is my seventh term, I have now lived in every possible permutation of partisan uh, control. And regardless of what that was, before Trump, it was any, whatever the issue was, it was basically a two-sided negotiation. Now it's a three-sided negotiation, and one of the sides is um, to be uh, as gentle as I can be, unpredictable. <laughs> and, and so I don't think there would be any problem at all getting Senate and House agreement on spending levels. We actually did it in a very, I think, a very responsible way that nobody was ecstatic, but nobody was angry. You mean with the agreement back from in, back in 2018? 20, yeah, for yeah. 2018 and 19. Uh, we did that, and I think we were uh, we were in tr on track to do that again. Uh, you know, I talked to Mitch. Mitch definitely wanted a two-year spending deal. They understand that the deal that we made uh, a year and a half ago would be a good uh, starting point for negotiations, and so we were. I think we're fine. Uh, Mick Mulvaney, whom I, I don't know if you're going to hear, we'll hear from uh, him at some point, but Mick's. Mick has his own attitude about what it should be. He wants to he wants to keep defense spending at a very high level and slash non-defense spending, um, which is a non-starter on on the, in the House anyway. So and the president has his own ideas. So again, today a group of Republican senators have gone are going to the White House to talk about the spending caps, and that's I think typical of the negotiations that there are no Democrats there. They seem to forget that we now control the House of Representatives. So what's the red line for Democrats, that there has to be some... I think the red line for Democrats in all these budget negotiations is that defense and non-defense be treated equally. Okay. We call it parity. People, different people define parity in uh, different ways. We, I define it as that whatever we do to defense, we do to non-defense. So if we raise de a defense a certain m amount, we need to raise non-defense. If we're going to cut, they both need to, to be cut. So like similar percentages increase. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and do you think what's the likelihood uh, any of this gets agreed upon before the August recess? I would say one out of three chances. Ooh, that doesn't sound very uh, optimistic. You know, I, I have not talked to Mick about this, but I know that he has told people that he wants to go as close to the September 30th deadline as he can because he thinks that enhances their uh, bargaining position. Mm -hmm. But again, I think Mitch McConnell's up for re-election in my state next year, and I don't think that he wants to have any threat of a shutdown this year because uh, it would clearly be the Republicans, uh, they would be blamed for it. So um, I, think they're, I think probably that's what they will tell the president this afternoon. Speaking of that September 30th deadline, that's also uh, the, around the time the government could potentially run out of money. This notion right. if we don't raise our debt ceiling, we wouldn't actually be able to pay all of our bills. Exactly. A very frightening state. We're going to hear from some Wall Street people later who will reiterate that. Um, do you think the debt ceiling should just be eliminated? Is there a better way to do this? Absolutely. I mean, it, 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 we have uh, we've raised the debt ceiling 80-something times since it was created. We're the only country in the world, other than Denmark, that has anything like that. Uh, all it does is create an, an opportunity for gridlock and for it creates another cliff that uh, we look over the edge of. It's, and it's, it's used for political leverage more than it is for any uh, sound fiscal policy. And again, we've ignored it, essentially. So we might as well get rid of it. Mm -hmm. Is there something else that you would like to see? I mean, we do have a $22 trillion debt. Obviously, people in this room are very concerned about what that means for the future. We just went through uh, last year, I was on part of the Joint Select Committee on Budget and Appropriations process, and it was a, a bicameral, bipartisan group. And we, we went for all year to try and figure out if there were ways structurally to enforce uh, spending discipline right. or budget budget discipline, and at the end of that time, uh, nothing in that area actually even got enough votes to be considered on the floor. So it was, no, you had to get 10 out of 16 votes to, to 
uh, pay, to get anything, to bring anything to the floor, and none of that did. So I'm not sure there is a mechanism. This is, it's always about political courage. It's not about, it's not about process. I want to switch a little bit um, to the long, longer term budget outlook. Um, today you're holding a hearing uh, you, in, on climate change and that's an impact on the budget. Under your leadership, the committee on the budget has also looked at proposals for single payer health care and Medicare for all, more commonly known. Um, you have said that Medicare for all, it's not if but when some right. sort of single payer will come into play. As you well know, the estimates for that are pretty large. The, I've, the independent estimates are anywhere from 25 trillion to 35 trillion over the next 10 years that the government would have to take on an additional cost that we'd have to figure out how to pay for. Um, how, how can we pay for that? Well, I mean, to a certain extent, we are paying for it now except we have a lot of different people paying for it. And this is one of the things that we have to be careful about when we talk about Medicare for All, because, for instance, uh, Pramila Jayapal's proposal, which mm -hmm. is the, the, probably the most uh, notable of the ones in the House, would basically say every bit of money that's being spent on health care, anywhere, anyhow, now becomes a federal responsibility, and there's actually no transfer of any other spending to to provide revenue to companies. So it essentially would be the biggest bailout of corporate America ever, because we would be taking every bit of money that uh, corporate America, not just corporate America, all employers are paying and shift that to the taxpayer. Mm -hmm. So you'd have to demand something of the employers uh, for in order to do that. We, the hearing we held was basically trying to identify all of the issues that you'd have to resolve in structuring or constructing right. a single-payer system. And there are a lot of choices that you can make. And among those is how do, you, how do you get the revenue? But I don't think that anybody, I mean, I think Pramila actually understands that you can't do that as well. Bernie, in his revised uh, proposal this year, actually has a 7.5% tax on uh, payroll. So you it, think that there has to be some tax increase? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. No, there's no question about it. And when I say that it, I don't think it's a matter of uh, if but when, uh, I doubt if it's actually going to come because Congress decides it's a good idea. I think it's going to come because corporate America is going to say, we can't do this anymore. Mm -hmm. We're competing in a global economy. Nobody else has to do this. We're competing with them, and we need a new system. I've had a number of CEOs, Fortune 500 companies, say that. Uh, unfortunately, they won't say it publicly yet. But <laughs> that's... Uh, I think that's going to change. And uh, while we're having kind of real talk here, um, you know, as you mentioned earlier, one of the key drivers of the pretty scary looking <laughs> budget picture for this country are Medicare and, and to a lesser extent Social Security. Is it inevitable that those programs will have to be altered? I think so, but I am, <laughs> A few years ago when Tim Geithner was Secretary of the Treasury and he came before the Budget Committee, we were in the minority. Uh, Tim Ryan was, I mean Paul Ryan was, was then uh, Chairman. And Paul has all these, the, all these charts going out 70 years and showing deficits and spending on all these mandatory spending programs. And uh, so when, when I got to question the Secretary, I said, you know, how reliable do you think those estimates are going out to 2075 and so forth? And Geithner said, I don't think projections past five years are reliable. And I think that the world is going to change so dramatically in a very short period of time that I'm not sure what's, I, I'm not sure you can even make reliable predictions about where Social Security is going to be, um, where healthcare is going to be. If we cure cancer, uh, Alzheimer's, and diabetes, which we could very well, you've essentially eliminated the, the financing problem of Medicare. Mm -hmm. What you'd have is created a, a lot more retirement issues. But uh, that, that's the point. The other day, uh, the chief... Well, let me just press okay. you on that. Go I ahead. mean, I, I'm the economics correspondent, and I'm with you. 2075, we're, we're not predicting very well. But, you know, the latest Social Security trustees report says that 
I know, I hate to use the term, we're going to run out of money, you know what I mean, right. but we won't have full 100% payments in 16 years. Right. Now that's a lot closer. Even people in this room who are, say, 60 could be impacted right. if in 16 to 20 years we're not able to send people the full amount that they were expecting. Exactly. That uh, seems a lot closer. It, it definitely is. Again, but you don't know what's going to happen in other phases of the economy that could make that either worse or inconsequential. Uh, I mean, you may be able to fund it through other means if you, can, if you find resources otherwise. The chief technology officer from Microsoft was in my community the, the other day, and she said that over the next 10 years, we will experience 250 years of change in this country. That is frightening, but you know, it's, it's one of these things that I'm obsessed about because I say, how do we make, po you know, Congress moves at its optimum efficiency at 10 miles an hour, <laughs> and the, the world's moving at 100. How do we make policy that uh, can accommodate that? And I'm focused on artificial intelligence, and we're gonna have a hearing at some point in the future on artificial intelligence and what that's gonna mean for the budget because yeah. it's gonna have probably the biggest impact of anything ever uh, in our history. And uh, so, well, let's, yeah. <laughs> um, I think we have time for just one last question, okay. and I want to run this by you. In your party, there's been a number of folks who are talking about this modern monetary theory. And yeah. basically, you know, that's, that's a bit detailed. But to get into it, it's this notion that the federal debt doesn't matter, that as long as we're the country, uh, the, the reserve currency, we're the country that everybody wants to buy our debt, then let's just run it up. Who cares? We can fund this. Um, can you clarify, do deficits matter? Um, well, sure, they do. It's a question of how much they matter. And what's interesting about that, and we're going to have a hearing, by the way, on do deficits matter, so you can come and testify if you want. <laughs> um, the thing about modern monetary theory is it all makes sense until it doesn't. Mm -hmm. And then it says, and if it, if it turns out to be wrong, then Congress will fix it. Well, I wouldn't rely on that. And that's what scares me about buying into that theory at all. But uh, what we also have seen is that all the rules that we have kind of lived by or the assumptions about how the economy works over the last 50 or 60 years don't seem to be applying now, hmm. where under normal circumstances you would, with huge debt you'd ex expect to see higher interest rates right. and so forth, blah, blah, blah. And none of that is, is panning out. So maybe the model is changing in such a way that uh, deficits don't matter as much. The other part of the big if of that thing, what you mentioned, is that's if we remain the, the world's Re right. reserve, <laughs> currency. reserve currency. Yeah. And that's not a guarantee. Not. As my old friend uh, David, um, David Obi said not too long ago, we were talking, and he said, you know, uh, democracy doesn't guarantee a happy ending. Mm. And that's kind of where we are, I think, at this juncture. Well, on that depressing note, <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for your time. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. Thank you all. <laughs>